Our first speaker today is Neil Caparoso. He uh, got his undergraduate degree at Rutgers University, and then he got a master's degree from there, and then he got a medical doctor's degree from there in 1980. So he did a residency in internal medicine, and in 1983, saw the light and came to NCI, and now he has to move his office every other year, <laughs> <laughs> just like the rest of us. So, um, in 2011, he became chief of the GEB, Genetic Epidemiology Branch. He's in the Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics at the NCI, and he's going to talk to us today about epidemiology, translational research, and clinical oncology. Take it away, Neil. Thank you so much. So, I'm going to give you folks a broad overview of epidemiology and um, a little bit about the basics, uh, but I'm also going to touch on some of the directions that uh, epidemiology is mutating into. Um, so I have a fair number of slides, and I'm not going to go into depth in all of them. You'll be happy to know, uh, but I'll try and emphasize the ones that are uh, most entertaining. So I'm going to touch on some uh, introductory concepts, some tools. Uh, some things that epidemiologists have actually accomplished and uh, what the challenges are and where we're going. So a few foundations. Uh, let me start off by saying that uh, our group is uh, located in NIH in the National Cancer Institute and we're part of the uh, intramural program uh, as those of you are in the, uh, uh, the clinical center in CCR. Uh, and we're part of the Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics. And right now, I'm uh, Chief of the Genetic Epidemiology Branch. Um, we have a number of other branches that uh, work on the environmental side. So, so there are a number of branches that investigate genetic causes of cancer and a number of others that uh, investigate uh, environmental causes of cancer. And of course, our division is generally dedicated to the etiology of cancer or causes of cancer, and that's uh, pretty much a general theme of epidemiology. So there's our one of our logos. Um, so uh, what does uh, DCEG do? Um, environmental and genetic causes of cancer, high quality, high impact, uh, evaluated research. Uh, we have studies all over the world. Um, and. Uh, the studies tend to emphasize molecular epidemiology, and I'll tell you a little bit about what uh, my view of molecular epidemiology is and what it means. And so um, our studies have had a lot of impact on uh, regulatory changes in our water, um, gasoline, uh, diesel exhaust, farming chemicals, uh, and we have specific studies in each of these areas. And every one of these studies has had a fairly dramatic, um, you know, you could spend a whole hour talking about any one of these studies. So the diesel uh, study, for example, um, uh, actually uh, was investigated a number of times because there are important chemical interests in this country that really don't want to um, have anybody regulating the use of diesel exhaust. So uh, the head of the occupational uh, studies branch was called to testify, testify before Congress four separate times uh, to defend that study. Um, so uh, epidemiologists have to contend with the political dimension to their work. Um, uh, Safe for farming, it, you know, it seems like such an innocuous thing. You just put the line up there safer farming. Well, there's a study, a giant cohort study called the Agricultural Health Study that investigates uh, pesticides and herbicides. And that study conflicts with uh, gigantic corporate interests like Monsanto that want to produce agricultural chemicals and don't really want them to be particularly regulated. And so um, there's similar kinds of conflicts there. Uh, so uh, we investigate cancer susceptibility syndromes on the genetic side, second cancers among cancer survivors, uh, preventive interventions, the radiation epidemiology branch, 
investigates uh, the impact of medical uh, radiation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, during the last year, a large study has been uh, launched to investigate whether uh, two or one um, doses of HPV vaccine is as effective as three doses. And you can imagine that this has an enormous impact on public health. If you can prevent um, uh, cervical cancer by uh, doing only one vaccination, it's much, much easier, less expensive, uh, and easier to implement than two or three um, uh, injections. Okay, so there's collaborations all around the world, and look at all the little dots, isn't that impressive? And uh, you can go to our website and find out all the kinds of um, studies that are being done. If any of you are interested in epidemiology as a career path, you can um, learn about you know, the hundreds of different studies in different areas that are uh, ongoing. Um, and there's uh, risk assessment tools, and risk assessment is a big deal, particularly if you want to screen for cancer. Uh, one of the discoveries that's come out um, of our group over the last few years is a quantitation of the idea that if you are going to screen for cancer, say lung cancer, to do that efficiently, you really want to identify the people at highest risk for that screening. It seems like common sense, but to show this, uh, it was a series of papers, including in New England Journal, that uh, actually showed this rigorously and mathematically, that um, you want to generate a risk model, and then you want to show with that risk model that uh, you're going after the people at highest risk to do your screening efficiently. So how do you do that with lung cancer, for example? Well, you want to identify the characteristics of smoking, for example, that are most associated with lung cancer. And then you want to know, well, what other features uh, are also most associated with risk of getting lung cancer? Things like you have COPD, how old you are, your family history of lung cancer, and a factor that our group identified, which is called time to first cigarette. So if the amount of time um, that between when you get up and when you smoke your first cigarette, if it's less than five minutes, your risk of lung cancer after taking everything else into account is three or four fold higher than someone that waits uh, over an hour for their first cigarette. So all those things need to be incorporated in a efficient risk model and that makes screening efficient. And although the National Lung Cancer Screening Trial showed that um, there's a 20% reduction in mortality with helical CT screening. Uh, the economics of introducing CT screening is really difficult and expensive, and you're not going to do it unless you have a better risk model. So uh, that's a little touch on it. Okay, so some introductory ideas. Um, epidemiology refers to uh, populations and disease in populations as opposed to medicine, which is disease in individuals. And it's an observational science as opposed to an experimental science. The idea being that we might look at a population and identify some individuals who are smokers and some individuals who are non-smokers. However, we don't give cigarettes to people and say, we want you to smoke those and we want you to not smoke. That would not be ethically permissible. So uh, that's one of the distinctions between an observational and an experimental science. And it's a particular we a methodologic weakness that those who don't like the particular conclusions that epidemiologic studies come to often criticize. And those are usually um, uh, individuals that have an interest in the outcome, for example, tobacco companies. And so when tobacco companies criticize the first case control studies of uh, cigarettes, they said, oh, it's an observational study. And so the results are not reliable and we don't believe them and you all should just keep on smoking. 
So um, uh, this is really the point I just made that epidemiologists are ethically prohibited from doing experiments on people. And this weakness was exploited by tobacco companies. Consequently, epidemiologists are concerned with the idea of establishing causality because what our study designs allow us to do is formulate statistical associations and those associations can be quite strong, but they may not be mechanistically compelling. And so we like to assemble evidence from other domains to make those arguments as compelling as possible. And I'll give you some examples as we go forward. So the goals of epidemiology generally identify the causes of cancer, quantify the risks, uh, elucidate the mechanisms where possible. Um, epidemiologists are always traditionally been, control, been concerned with public health. So you'll hear the statement all the time that, you know, the people who cleaned up the drinking water saved more lives than all the physicians, blah, 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 that kind of thing. But epidemiologists really do have a public health orientation and take this very, very seriously. Um, epidemiologists emphasize prevention. So lots of examples of this, vaccines, um, uh, all sorts of uh, interventions that prevent disease. Uh, there are a number of downsides though to prevention that I have to be frank with you about. Um, one thing about prevention is it takes time and it's very expensive to demonstrate that a preventive intervention is effective. And it's not very dramatic. Uh, you can't really see the disease that you've prevented. You don't have a grateful person that comes to you and says, thank you for saving my child. You know, because frankly, they don't know that the vaccine saved their child. Um, they kind of take it for granted. And if their child, you know, 10 years later, develops a rash, well, maybe it was your vaccine that did it, you know, so they're not always so grateful. Um, and this translates to political out, um, impact. So dramatic treatments are very effective uh, with politicians, um, whereas preventive interventions um, tend to be more difficult. And so it really takes a certain amount of, um, uh, I don't know, uh, both intelligence and real orientation towards uh, public health to be dedicated to this. Uh, and also you have to be willing to fight political opposition. So whereas years ago uh, we had the tobacco companies and that's a little bit passe, now you have uh, companies that pretty much uh, advocate uh, processed foods, and foods that have no nutritional value, but basically are pure sugar and um, are marketed to kids and um, uh, are contribute to the obesity epidemic. And so it's very clear that obesity is strongly related to diabetes, heart disease, and about eight different cancers. So it's gonna take probably a generation to develop that public health consciousness and you know, have kind of interventions that will be effective. And meantime, uh, all of those companies are fighting tooth and nail to prevent that from happening. And the same thing with polluters and uh, companies that make chemicals. So you really are uh, in a political battle. And finally, Nobel Prizes. So in spite of the fact that um, the discovery that tobacco was the cause of lung cancer and tobacco in the next century will likely cause a billion, that's a billion with a B, excess deaths. Okay, so roll that number around in your mind a little bit. A billion, a billion with a B. Gosh, that's a lot of deaths. Okay, that's more than the number of deaths than a lot of other causes. Um, nevertheless, the discoveries, and then we can go through a lot of discoveries, we could have a whole talk on just the series of discoveries about tobacco. No Nobel Prizes for that one. Um, for some reason, the scientific plus the political fight to do that 
um, was not considered as important as, say, you know, uh, blowing in the wind or, you know, I don't know, um, that's a joke. Um, you know, whatever the, the latest uh, chemist did to win the Nobel Prize, or the latest um, medical Nobel Prize. So, okay. So what are some of the concerns uh, that epidemiologists have? Um, one is bias, which is uh, a systematic deviation from uh, truth. And an example of a kind of bias is uh, participation rates. So epidemiologists are very worried about participation rates because if you have a low participation rate in a study, the subjects that are in the study are not going to be very representative of the general public. And you generally want the people in your study to be able to generalize the results from your study to the wide world out there. If you can't do that, um, your results are of limited value. So that's an important thing. And uh, in fact, if you take a careful look at many, many studies, the results aren't so generalizable. So let me give you an example. The UK Biobank. Now, if I said to you, is that a representative study? You think about it, wow, that's the general population of the United Kingdom, and it's associated with their healthcare system. Yeah, that sounds like it'd be pretty representative. In fact, less than 15% of the people that are invited to participate in that study actually do participate. And you have to wonder, why is that? Well, maybe they don't want to give blood. Maybe they don't want to participate in a questionnaire that takes an hour. Maybe they just don't want to be bothered. You know, maybe they've been drinking a lot and they're like, I have a headache today. I, you know, well, I don't want you to know how much I drink or whatever the reason is, they may not be so representative of the general population. And whatever the reason is, it, it detracts from the generalizability of that study. So compromises always have to be made, but it is something you need to keep in mind. So I'll give you one example from real life. In 2003, we did what at the time was the largest lung cancer study in the world. And we had site visitors that came and they said, look, if you can't get a high participation rate, uh, we're not going to give you the $8 million you need to do this study. And so we said, okay, we'll do a pilot study to get a high participation rate. And the first thing we did was a phone survey. We called up people and said, hey, have we got a study for you? Um, you, you get to give blood and do a questionnaire, and it's a really great study. What do you say? 30% of people said they'd participate, and that was not high enough. So then we sent them an invitation letter. We followed up by phone. We said, if you're in the hospital, it's okay. We put advertisements uh, in the hospitals and in magazines. We offered them a cash award in gasoline, which in Italy at the time was a big deal. Um, we got their physician to write a letter, and we said we'd come to their home. That got it up to 49%. Still no good. We could not have done the study. So then we got new interviewers. So for the men, we got attractive nurses. Um, and for the women, we had male nurses. Um, we had the physicians call. We gave them gas coupons. Um, did I say that already? Instead of money. We had ads on TV by a very popular night show host. Um, we had a better invitation letter that was written at a fourth grade level instead of a more sophisticated level. We got a letter from the mayor. Their mayor was very popular. And we had a 1-800 line. With those innovations, we got a 73% participation rate, which was adequate. But it was really hard to do. That pilot study over a year took about a million dollars. So it's not easy to do a study to get this kind of, just something to keep in mind. Um, okay. Epidemiologists worry about the controls in your study. Um, population controls are really expensive. Uh, what's population control? Population control is 
representative of the population. And the issue with population controls um, is that it's impossible to get them these days. In the past, you used to use RDD, which is random digit dialing. Now, if you do random digit dialing, every one of you knows if you have a landline, you get a nuisance call, what do you do? You don't even look at it, you hang up. It's like, don't bother me. So it's incredibly hard to get good controls. And um, uh, so you have to make compromises. It's, it's a really uh, difficult thing. And when you read about high response rates in, um, uh, in papers, you, know, you say, well, what was their response rate? Was their response rate really 70%? You need to be very critical when you uh, believe them because it's very hard to get. It was hard 10 years ago in Italy. Uh, it's even harder uh, today to do that. And I don't have time to tell you about all the theoretical advantages of uh, good controls, but um, there, there are advantages. Okay, if you call an epidemiologist because you have a study and you'd like some help, the epidemiologist is gonna ask you about your study design, where your controls came from, do you have covariates. Um, a, an issue I get all the time is Somebody applies to use the PLCO or the NLST biospecimens. And they say, I have a fabulous marker for lung cancer. Could I please have uh, some serum from the National Lung Cancer Screening Trial because I'm gonna test it versus your controls. And I know that my marker is spectacular to detect lung cancer because we tested it in some lung cancers already. And it picked up the lung cancers. So my first question is, oh, did you adjust for confounders? And they say, well, what's a confounder? I said, well, did you match them on smoking? Because you know what? Most people with lung cancer smoke. And if you just took lung cancer patients that are smokers and you took controls that are non-smokers, your wonderful biomarker may be a really great biomarker of smoking. It may be cotinine. Cotinine is a great lung cancer marker, but it's of no use whatsoever as a lung cancer screen. Because we know already, we can ask people if they're smokers. We already have that in the risk model. So we don't need it. You need, you need all the covariates. So that's an example of um, something you need. So bias confounding, original hypothesis, meaning you, there's a difference between um, here's another one that you get a call from someone who says, I, I, I tested a biomarker and it's, it predicts liver cancer in a cohort. It, it's strongly associated with liver cancer. And what you find out after talking with them is that they tested the biomarker versus 30 endpoints. And there was a statistical association with one cancer. And so, well, what's the probability that you get a significant association at a p-value of 0.05? Uh, it's one in 20. So if you tested 30 endpoints, of course you're gonna find one that's significant. So um, that's called data dredging. Uh, and power calculations and validation are uh, some other issues that are very important. So, uh, just a common question that epidemiologists get. How can you explain this? My grandmother smoked all her night, her life. She didn't exercise, didn't use a seatbelt. She ate bacon every day. Um, she drank. She outlived all her doctors. Um, how do you explain that? And the answer is that epidemiology is a probabilistic science. It's not deterministic. So you always get individual outliers. In fact, Individual outliers are a mathematical certainty. You're always gonna get them. So it's just something to keep in mind. It's just a little. Okay, so what tools do epidemiologists use? And um, one very cool tool that is still uh, being used are the maps. So there's cancer mortality maps and cancer incidence maps. And what these tend to show you is that 
cancer is geographically associated. And so here's an example showing the red in the south. And this is uh, incident, this is mortality um, from melanoma. And obviously this is due to sun exposure and melanoma is associated with the sun. So you see a geographic pattern that's um, very indicative of sun. So lately, um, we have been doing some studies of circadian variation and looking at variation in cancer rates by time zone. So we look at the time zones and we can see some associations with time zones. So I don't have time to go into that, but the maps are very, very helpful for these kinds of studies. Uh, and more sophisticated studies can now be done with satellite data using uh, geographic information systems. This is the whole emerging uh, area. And a lot of studies are done with SEER, which is surveillance, epidemiology, and end results program. So this covers 26% of the US population. Uh, I believe it's 11 states and it has data on incidence and survival and patient demographics. And first tumor site, tumor morphology, uh, histology, um, and a lot of other cool information. And so um, it's ecologic data, meaning you don't have individual risk factor data, that covariate data I told you that's important, but it's uh, very, very valuable uh, and important. And it gives you, um, and it's searchable. There's a, there's a ton of information that you can analyze online. Um, and an example um, of how interesting this data is, uh, if you look at cancer incidence data, uh, you see a rise in cancer uh, back in 1994 or so. And does anybody know what happened here? There's this rise in men and there's not a corresponding rise in women. So this was when um, they introduced PSA screening. So the rise was due to prostate. They discovered a lot of cases of prostate cancer due to PSA screening. So this was actually kind of a glitch in the data, an inaccuracy or a, um, it's not exactly inaccurate. The data was accurate, but it was a, uh, um, something that had to be taken into account. And it was more prominent in African-Americans than uh, whites. Um, there's incidence and mortality data. And many times when you see a big difference between incidence and mortality, one of the things it tells you is that there's an effective treatment. And in fact, there is effective treatment for many kinds of uh, pediatric malignancy, as you well know. So uh, I mentioned to you that um, because epidemiology depends on statistical associations, uh, there's a lot of attention given to proving causation. And so uh, there's some classical criteria for proving a cause. And uh, th some of these criteria are that us, an association that we believe is reliable as a causal one should be a high risk, a high relative risk. It should be consistent over numerous studies. It should show a dose response. When you have more of whatever it is, the rate, the risk should go up. The cause should occur temporally before the cancer. That's always important. And the biology should make sense. It should be some kind of a mechanism that um, that's in there. Um, lately, there are, uh, other and more sophisticated and more direct approaches to um, get at this. One of them is called Mendelian randomization. Um, so I encourage you to go look this up and read about it, but basically it involves uh, looking, uh, doing a genome-wide association study on the factor and on the disease and looking to see if they share genetic ideologic factors, and that would be an element that would tend to support a causal association. And molecular epidemiology involves using biomarkers to infer mechanisms, and mediation analysis 
um, involves a more complex uh, kind of causal analysis. So epidemiologists use all of these uh, to try and infer causality in a more sophisticated way. And this just shows with cigarettes how three um, cohort studies showed a beautiful dose response, a consistent dose response with cigarettes smoked per day. And they also showed a nice temporal relationship that it took time after cigarettes were introduced for lung cancer rates to rise. And uh, also mechanistically, it made sense. And this is a famous set of experiments by Oscar Auerbach, a pathologist um, in Louisiana who did uh, famous studies with smoking beagles where he attached uh, smoking machines to these beagles and then dissected their respiratory tree and showed that the exact same progressive changes occurred in the respiratory tree um, as they developed um, premioplasia and then uh, lung cancer. And um, some beautiful work also in cohorts that showed that when people quit smoking uh, over the years, their uh, rates of lung cancer slowly and consistently fell to approach that of non-smokers, although it never quite equals that of non-smokers. So it asymptotically approaches a relative risk of one, but never quite gets there. So the risk in former smokers persists, although it certainly improves over 20 years. Okay, so what have epidemiologists accomplished? Um, uh, it's, I'm a little overwhelmed with the idea of kind of going over what epidemiologists have accomplished. But um, uh, I'll just tell you that um, looks like coffee is not associated with uh, any particular uh, cancers or uh, adverse uh, effects. It's a nice study by uh, my friend Neil Friedman. Um, smoking is associated with bladder cancer. There's been a lot of uh, studies. Um, breast implants, Chernobyl, oral mouthwash. Um, a lot of studies have been no. In other words, cell phones are not strongly associated with brain tumors. Although I understand there's some new data coming out which may show some small associations. But um, this is probably an area where um, the radiation epidemiology group gets the most calls. People are most worried about cell phones. But um, probably the big worry was for cell phones over 10 years ago when they had a lot more um, emissions than they do today. Um, in general, although uh, modern epidemiology has identified the general and specific causes of cancer and they mean as advocates of public health, um, the identification of tobacco as the major causal factor for lung cancer and seven other major tumors, all of which are difficult to treat, and the role of secondary tobacco smoke. So I will just spend a second on secondary tobacco smoke. You realize that the discovery um, that secondary tobacco smoke was associated with a number of cancers uh, and other conditions is what allowed clean air legislation to go forward and means that when you get on an airplane or you go in a movie theater or you go to a restaurant, you don't have to breathe in other people's smoke. And so you're saved from uh, not only that risk, but the annoyance of um, being exposed to all of that. And that also, um, contributed to a social milieu that makes smoking less acceptable and in turn um, makes the per capita rate of smoking less um, uh, go down. So it's an enormous uh, public service that came from those epidemiologic studies. Okay, the general risk factors for cancer though are age, um, as we like to say, E and G and combinations of E and G. 
Um, Tobacco is still the biggie. Uh, diet is going down in importance. And there's a, I would say, a crisis in nutritional epidemiology. And it's worth just taking 30 seconds to tell you about this. And that uh, most of the studies of dietary factors uh, purported to be either um, protective or risk factors for cancer have proven to be challenging and difficult. The hope now is by using molecular epidemiology techniques, that is biomarkers like newer techniques like metabolomics, we'll figure out a mechanistic basis to understand some of the associations. So there is data, and for instance, IARC data, um, that still supports a weak association of meat consumption, red meat consumption with some cancers, uh, and a, a weak protective effect of fruit and vegetables on a number of cancers. But um, you know, most of the associations with individual nutrients, like B vitamins, have um, you know, kind of washed out and um, don't seem to be present. So uh, it's been really tough to prove um, nutritional associations with cancer. And the newer generation of studies will be needed to, to prove them. Uh, that said, most cancer is due to the environment. And the evidence for this is that there are dramatic differences in rates of different cancers uh, in different countries. So melanoma, between the highest, which is Australia, and the lowest, which is Japan, the ratio is over 100. Now, some of this is due to genetics. And so you may say, well, wait a minute. If it's due to genetics, how do you know it's genetics or the environment. How do you know that? So a component is due to genetics, but we know from migration studies where people of one group go to another country, typically um, when that happens, they acquire the rate fairly rapidly of the new country. So this occurs with most cancers, and I'll tell you one or two exceptions. For instance, breast cancer and prostate cancer, within a generation, um, if Asians migrate to San Francisco, they acquire the rates of cancer of the United States um, within a few decades. Now, there's one or two examples where that's not the case. For instance, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Um, but chronic lymphocytic leukemia, which is the most common adult leukemia, um, has no known extrinsic environmental causes but it's, uh, it has some strong genetic causes. So that may be an exception. Um, here's an example of an environmental cause. Uh, when we look at the maps, Zhenwei uh, province in China and the county specific uh, mortality rates based on a map were super high. And when you go there, what do you see? Well, they have indoor ovens that create incredible uh, levels of indoor pollutants. So the, they have ovens underneath the beds called tangs uh, that they use for heating. And those, uh, those smoky coal ovens um, result in extremely high rates of uh, lung cancer in that province. And uh, the cancer maps um, also showed a high rate in Montana. And I had a map here. I don't, I, that slide somehow dropped out. But there was a copper smelter that uh, contaminated the area with arsenic. And that accounted for a high rate of lung cancer around this smelter in Montana. And um, uh, when we, they removed the smelter, the rates went down. So um, this just a, reminds us that Tobacco is the bad guy. And I think I've told you a little bit. I've told you enough about tobacco, so I'm not going to go on and on about it. Um, one good thing about tobacco in the United States is that uh, after the Surgeon General report and um, all of the public health consequences, the rates of smoking in the United States have steadily declined. And that's a combination of individual knowledge, but also public health efforts and social efforts. So you can see these rates continue to fall and 
the rate of adult smokers in the United States is now below 20 percent. Still low, uh, rather shockingly high, and you think that still something just under one in five U.S. adults still smokes. And worldwide, as I said, we are anticipating a billion deaths uh, in the next century from smoking. And most of that is because um, the tobacco companies have exported their industry to developing countries like India and China. And I told you a little bit um, about uh, environmental tobacco smoke, so I won't uh, perseverate on this too much. Okay, alcohol is the number two carcinogen, and it's associated with a number of different uh, cancers. The five top ones are oral, pharynx, esophagus, larynx, and liver, and there are some interactions with smoking. And ionizing radiation is also a big extrinsic uh, cause. I'm going to move ahead uh, to say a word about uh, some newer studies and uh, skip over some of these because I think this is material you can go over and you know certainly look up more on your own if you're interested. Uh, so Chernobyl. Uh, Non-ionizing radiation is uh, a major uh, cause of skin cancer uh, and aging of the skin. Uh, infections are an emerging cause of cancer, and investigation of the microbiome is a uh, extremely important uh, area. Um, HPV, over the last year, um, an investigator in our group sequenced the HPV virus, and that's an extraordinary um, finding and discovery. And uh, what it's showing is that some characteristics of the virus contribute to carcinogenicity. So you'll be hearing a lot more about that in the literature. Um, Fusobacterium. Uh, is prevalent in uh, colorectal carcinoma, and I think that you're going to see a lot of discoveries um, uh, with regard to uh, colorectal carcinoma as a number of studies of the fecal microbiome um, mature. And there's a lot in occupational uh, epidemiology. Can I mention the diesel exhaust studies? Okay, so what are some challenges? So on the environmental side, uh, for a number of cancers, we still know nothing uh, about the risk factors. So we don't really understand much about the risk factors for uh, example, as I mentioned, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Uh, also, beyond um, a few risk factors, for example, for breast cancer, hormonal factors and alcohol, uh, we don't really understand uh, the risk factors for many common cancers. So uh, I mentioned breast, but really prostate's a better example. Age and family history, beyond that, not so much is known about uh, the risk factors for prostate cancer. Um, how genes and environment work together is not well understood, um, and many of the potential causes are poorly studied. Okay, I mentioned chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Um, I mentioned some of the challenges in nutritional epidemiology. I don't have time to go into a lot of the issues with diet, but believe me, that could also be a whole uh, talk. Uh, in our study in Italy that I told you about earlier, we did look at uh, fresh uh, red and processed meat intake and did show a dose response. And probably the most consistent finding in nutritional epidemiology is that the more red and processed meat you eat over a variety of cancers, the more your risk increases. So treating meat as a condiment is probably not a bad idea. Um, so is the answer genetics? Yes and no. Uh, for common cancers, GWAS studies show that there are numerous genes associated with virtually every cancer. However, the risks associated with each one is small and a big issue is that when you put all those small risks, by small, I mean a relative risk of 1.1 to 1.3. So when you put a risk factor of 1.3 in a risk model, and you take three or four or five of them, and you put them all in there, what happens? 
Ah, unfortunately, not too much. It doesn't increase the risk a great deal. So it hasn't proven extraordinarily helpful. Has it taught us a lot about the mechanism? Well, a little bit, but not so much. Um, so uh, we still have a ways to go on the genetic side as well. Uh, however, one thing that is well established is that uh, virtually all cancer is associated with genetic changes in the tumor. And in fact, um, our group, our division, is establishing a new group to characterize those genetic changes in tumor. One problem, though, is that to do a good job in sequencing tumor, you really need fresh tumor. And fresh tumor is not always e available. In fact, unless your study uh, gets liquid nitrogen and has it in the operating room when the fresh tumor is obtained, um, sequencing can be difficult because it's hard to do it from paraffin sections. So this is something that the next generation of studies will have to be um, established to, uh, to collect. Um, the other thing you need if you're going to do this is very good covariate data. So there are collections of fresh tissue, but many times they don't have the covariate data. You really want that good exposure data in addition to the good clinical data and the high quality tissue to do these kinds of studies. Okay, so I'm not gonna go into the details of genetic studies, but um, you do, there are studies that focus on germline and there are studies that focus on tumor tissue and there are family and population studies and there are studies that look at everything, agnostic studies and there are studies that look at specific candidate genes. Um, virtually every tumor has a genetic component and this is shown by uh, one example in lung cancer, but every study, when you look carefully at family history, uh, tends to show excess risk um, uh, associated with family members with cancer. And here's an example, 1.57, uh, or about a 60% increased risk if you have a first degree relative with cancer after adjusting for every other risk factor. Okay. So I'm going to skip over some of the genetics and just tell you, uh, touch on two more topics. Uh, what is molecular epidemiology? Well, traditional epidemiology started out just by relating exposures to disease. So how many people smoked? How many cases and controls got lung cancer? We do some simple calculations and determine if there's an association. Molecular epidemiology, though, includes an assessment of genes, uses biomarkers to assess internal dose, early biological effect, intermediate markers that assess altered structure or function, and maybe tries to get early disease, and takes all of these markers into account. Whoops. So this is the idea of molecular epidemiology, which emerged about two decades ago. Uh, as I said, we did a lung cancer case control study where we actually got the tumor, put it in liquid nitrogen, gave it to the pathologist, would section a piece of tumor, and we put it immediately in liquid nitrogen. Um, we paired this with a questionnaire that gathered all that covariate data and so, for example, when we looked at the information on meat, we would assess things like doneness because there was data that suggested that um, the amount of heterocyclic amines in meat was related to the time and temperature that you cooked meat. So burnt meat had a lot more heterocyclic amines. So to address this question, we would assess how uh, people would respond on the questionnaire to how they cooked their meat by pointing at a picture. So molecular epidemiology accomplished a lot of things. Uh, examples 
showed HPV was the cause of 100% of cervical cancer. Before they actually were able to assess HPV, they would get associations with, for example, number of sexual partners. So that was a good piece of information um, that suggested that, oh, an infectious agent could be working here. But actually sequencing the virus um, established this in a much better way. Um, another study showed that cutting down on smoking is ineffective. Why? Because biomarker studies shows that you would alter the topography of how you smoke in a way that you still absorb the same amount of carcinogens. Why? Because you're addicted. You're addicted to nicotine. So your body um, alters the way you inhale the cigarette smoke to get so that you still get the same amount of carcinogens. And of course, GWAS studies. Um, we're all based on biomarkers. Okay, and then there's integrative epidemiology that adds behavior, like that time to first cigarette that I told you about, and outcome. So not only do we look at disease, but we look at whether people survive. So if we, that's the term integrative epidemiology. It's kind of added on to molecular epidemiology when you add behavior and outcome. Okay. And a lot of these studies uh, are done in consortia. And uh, the consortia try to harmonize the different questionnaires by using online resources like Benex. Um, I've almost used my hour, so I'm going to take two more minutes and then stop and let you ask a, a few questions. Uh, just to tell you that. Um, there's a lot of exposure areas that have not been able to be studied with traditional approaches. And I'm just going to mention these. Uh, these are kind of the future. So uh, one is sleep. And traditional questionnaires tended to ignore sleep. But um, sleep is incredibly important. And the new generation of apps that many of you probably have, like the Fitbits, automatically record sleep, and it provides a wealth of data, and length of sleep and timing of sleep is uh, clearly associated with a number of conditions. So this is an area uh, being explored. Physical activity and inactivity is also super important, and there's a recent study that uh, showed associations with cancer. Um, very difficult to collect information in a questionnaire, um, but again, these Fitbits and other um, uh, devices can collect information. Uh, heart rate, both uh, resting heart rate and variability in heart rate um, are important um, and need to be studied. Social factors, um, there's been data that from Framingham showing that um, a lot of important traits like obesity and smoking uh, tend to be uh, linked to your social network. Um, interesting studies showing that most voters tend to only know voters who vote the same as they do. So um, uh, this is a factor that um, needs to be studied a lot more. Uh, your geographic location, your zip code, is an incredibly important determinant of what diseases you will ultimately suffer from, including your economics. Um, smoking can be uh, determined by these devices, by the movement of your arm, just as your Fitbit records your steps based on a certain movement. Smokers can be characterized uh, by the same kinds of movements. Uh, weather and climate hasn't been uh, much studied, but can be now. Um, and circadian variation is an area that I'm spending almost half my time now studying. and. Uh, uh, all I'll say is that uh, circadian dysregulation uh, looks like it has very important associations with four conditions, um, mood disorders, obesity, diabetes, and cancer. And I don't have enough time to go into it now, but I can answer questions if you want. I'll stop there. Thank you.
what about the use of drugs like methane to stop smoking? So, um, the use of drugs in smoking cessation is incredibly important because the point prevalence of success at smoking cessation at one year um, is only about 5%. In other words, someone just says, I'm quitting. I have quit. I stopped smoking today, and I've quit. One year later, if you come back to that person, 5% will have succeeded. However, if you, in succession, apply a number of um, methods, the first is counseling. Simple counseling at least doubles the rate of success. Um, then nicotine replacement, again, doubles the rate. So you, you're going to get up to 15, 20% by nicotine replacement. Then first generation drugs like bupropion um, that uh, also help a lot. The best of the drugs. Um, is Chanix, which actually goes to the nicotinic receptor and is very effective. Now, the problem with Chanix is that it had one of those black boxes that, um, because apparently people had um, a variety of nasty side effects, which may have been related to genetic um, subtypes. Uh, and I believe, and I'm not up on the very latest on this, that the FDA removed some of those restrictions recently. But Chanix is a pretty effective uh, intervention. And the combination of counseling and multimodality drug use um, can improve smoking cessation success to a range of 50%. So it's clearly effective, and I would say that um, Anyone who's contemplating smoking cessation should definitely get counseling and try one or more of these methods to maximize their success. And also, if they've tried in the past and haven't succeeded, that doesn't you know, hurt them at all. Each successive chance improves the chance that they'll succeed. So um, it's you know, tremendous health benefits of quitting smoking at any age. So um, it depends on the kind of outliers. And statisticians have a variety of techniques for dealing with outliers. Um, I guess for epidemiologists, the most common technique is grouping. So um, you may have someone with an incredibly high dose of something, and you just group that person. Yeah, quartiles and quintiles, and look at risk by quartiles. So um, there's a number of, of statistical approaches to deal with outliers. You, you also worry about the quality of the data. So um, yeah, it's not usually a big problem. Yes? So that's a great question. And I think the key items um, are that a slide I showed earlier on, but the quality of the control group, the size of the study, and the, the confidence intervals. It's really important. You don't want to just look at the p-value, but the confidence intervals. So um, a statistically significant result should not include one. So for instance, you might say an odds ratio of five. But if the, the odds ratio is five and the confidence intervals are 4.5 to 5.5, that's a very strong result. If the confidence interval is 1.1 to 20, you, know, you really want to look at that study carefully. Um, I think you know, the main thing is read the methods carefully. Uh, and, you know, kind of be suspicious. Um, you know, look and see if they quote 
a response rate. You know, how many people actually participated in the study compared to the number that were um, uh, invited? And then the other thing is covariates. You know, what did they adjust for? I feel kind of bad for people that look at, at these studies that don't know the details because many times I see, oh, we adjusted for smoking. And then I look at, how did you adjust? And they said, well, we adjusted by saying they were a smoker or a non-smoker. What? Okay. What that means is you lumped, how did you treat former smokers? Okay, they're at risk. So you took current and former and non-smokers. Did you adjust for each one as an indicator variable? And what about the strongest variable associated with smoking-related disease is the duration of smoking. So if you didn't take duration into account, then you, you, most of the effect of smoking is still there, even after an adjustment for current smoking. So you have to think, wow, smoking is still the most important thing. So if you did a biomarker study and you just adjusted for current smoking, still duration and quantity and intensity of smoking are the main drivers. And you'd never know that if they said, oh, yeah, we adjusted for smoking. Sorry, it's a little pet peeve. So I put my email there, and you have my handout. Any questions, don't hesitate to email me. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I always try and walk out with that. OK, we have one announcement. That being we're going to be doing the pathology core visit right after this next lecture. So people can just wait out in the hall, and then I'll walk you over to Building 10. I don't want you to get lost. Building 10 is very complicated. So our next speaker is Hao Ben Chen. I have a question. He got his MD degree slide. from Shanghai uh, Medical uh, University in China. He got a PhD degree from New York University. Subsequently, he was a research assistant professor at New York. Then he did a medical residency in Brooklyn. He came to NCI in 2013 as a clinical fellow in the thoracic and GI oncology branch, and now he's an assistant clinical investigator. He's going to tell us about small cell lung cancer. All of it. Yeah, thank you so much, Terry. And thanks for the previous uh, the lecture. So it had really kind of helped to uh, let you know that uh, smoking is actually the most uh, important uh, environmental etiology of the lung cancers. So today, actually, I'm going to talk about the small cell lung cancer. So here is a little bit like background information about myself. As Terry mentioned that uh, um, actually I had a medical education in China and then came to the United States for a PhD education. And I had always wanted to be a physician scientist. So that's why I kind of came back to do the residency training and then fellowship training. So about three years ago, I did the exact same thing as you are doing right now by attending the TRACO courses. And I learned a lot. And uh, I feel really honored to be here to give a talk on the small cell lung cancer. All right, so yeah, let's just dive in. So this is the outline of uh, my today's uh, the talk. Uh, the lung cancer can be roughly divided into two major types, small cell lung cancer and non-small cell lung cancer. The, la uh, the later also include uh, the three uh, histological subtypes, uh, including the um, the lung adenocarcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and the large cell uh, carcinoma. And Dr. Zabo is actually going to uh, give you a talk on the non-small cell lung cancer uh, in the next month. And the reason to uh, classify the lung cancer into small cell and non-small cell is because uh, small cells behave very differently from the non-small cell lung cancer. Small cell tends to uh, metastasize very early in its course. And uh, the prognosis of uh, the patients with the small cell uh, is also much worse compared to uh, non-small cell patients. And small cell lung cancer uh, comprise uh, of uh, 10 to 15 percent of uh, all, all lung cancer cases. And uh, it is a smoker's disease. So the patients with uh, small cell lung cancer uh, oftentimes, uh, actually almost always have uh, like decades of uh, like tobacco smoking history. However, uh, in recent years, uh, you know, the patients with uh, lung adenocarcinoma can also develop 
uh, small cell lung cancer uh, after uh, EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitor treatment. And these patients are, are usually uh, non-smokers. And the uh, small cell lung cancer is a, a neuroendocrine tumor. So one unique feature of uh, small cell lung cancer is that it can be associated with uh, the paraneoplastic uh, endocrine neuropathy, such as uh, Cushing syndrome, which is due to the excessive production of ACTH uh, by the uh, small cell lung cancer cells. All right, so the morphology of the small cell lung cancer. You probably have uh, already figured out that the small cell lung cancer got its name because the size of the tumor cells are small. So small cell lung cancer is also known as an O cell carcinoma. And um, you know, on the pathology slides, it look like uh, old grains. And it, has, it, is, or it is a sm small over cell with a scanty uh, cytoplasm. So on the uh, pathology slides here, and uh, the uh, arrow actually points to the small cell lung cancer cells. And uh, the arrowhead actually points to the uh, lymphocytes. So as we know that the lymphocytes are uh, very small cells. So you know, in this case, uh, the small cell lung cancer cells are just a little bit bigger than the uh, lymphocytes. Uh, small cell lung cancer cells are uh, very sensitive to uh, chemotherapy and uh, radiation therapy. However, the problem is that uh, they develop resistance uh, very quickly. So in the 1950s, a uh, researcher has found that uh, the uh, nitrogen mustard compound can actually shrink uh, small cell lung cancers. And uh, later, uh, the cyclophosphamide was also found to be uh, effective in treating uh, small cell lung cancers. In the early 1970s, so several uh, randomized clinical trials uh, proved that uh, the combination, uh, combination chemotherapy can uh, extend a patient's survival uh, compared to the uh, single agent uh, chemotherapy. In the 1980s and uh, early 1990s, the, the platinum and the etoxide doublet uh, you know, established its role as a first line therapy. Uh, unfortunately, uh, in the past 30 plus years, uh, it remains to be the first line chemotherapy. This is not because of a lack of uh, trying, but just that we haven't been able to find a better chemo regimen than platinum and etoxide. And the only second line agent approved by the FDA is a topotecan. So here, actually, I have a question. Does anyone know by what, so what's uh, the uh, mechanism of action of etoxide and uh, topotecan? OK. Good. All right. Sorry. All right. So etopside actually is uh, the uh, topoisomerase 2 inhibitor, and the topotecan is uh, the topoisomerase uh, 1 inhibitor. So in small cell lung cancer, uh, the topoisomerase expression are you know, much higher than comparing to uh, the normal lung tissues. All right. So the small cell lung cancer can be uh, kind of classified into uh, two uh, stages, uh, limited disease stage and extensive disease stage. So the difference is that uh, whether you know, the disease can be uh, covered by a single radiation port or not. So uh, if uh, the disease is limited to just the one side of uh, hemisorax and it can be covered by a single radiotherapy port, so we call it a limited disease. And the treatment for the limited disease of small cell lung cancer should be uh, radiation plus uh, uh, systemic chemotherapy. However, if the disease is more than uh, one uh, the single radiation port, then it's an extensive uh, disease, and the treatment should be uh, systemic uh, chemotherapy. So if uh, a patient uh, with an extensive stage of a small cell lung cancer has a response after first-line chemotherapy, and then we tend to give a patient a prophylactic uh, cranial irradiation. And the reason is that uh, the small cell uh, lung cancer can uh, spread to many different parts of the body. However, brain is a sanctuary site of the chemotherapy. 
So the chemotherapy agents cannot reach a high concentration in the brain. So when a patient uh, has a recurrence and the brain is a common site. So in the 1990s, so meta-analysis meta has shown that uh, the uh, PCI, prophylactic cranial irradiation, can actually improve the overall survival of the small cell lung cancer patients uh, with a completed remission from the initial therapy. Uh, in 2007, uh, a New, New England Journal paper uh, demonstrated that uh, by randomized clinical trial, the prophylactic cranial irradiation uh, can decrease the brain metastases and improve uh, progression-free survival and overall survival in the patients with extensive disease small cell lung cancer and with a response after the initial uh, chemotherapy. And on the right-hand side, I just show the uh, kaplan Meier curve of overall survival in patients with or without uh, the prophylactic uh, cranial irradiation. So the dotted curve show the patients uh, with uh, the uh, PCI and uh, the, the most the line here show the patients uh, uh, without a PCI. And they can see the difference of uh, the overall survival. So in 2012, uh, the US Congress passed the uh, uh, Recalcitrant Cancer Research Act. So in this act, uh, it actually requires the NCI director uh, within 18 months to develop a scientific uh, research uh, framework uh, for the cancers with a five-year survival rate of less than uh, 50 percent. And at a sense of urgency, uh, the act also requires the NCI director to, uh, to identify two or more cancers uh, with a five-year relative survival rate of less than 20 percent and uh, also has uh, the uh, annual uh, deaths of uh, over uh, 30,000 in the U.S. So uh, only like two cancers uh, meet such a uh, criteria. Uh, so first one is a pancreatic cancer, and the second one is a small cell lung cancer. So small cell lung cancer has uh, less than 7% of uh, a five-year uh, survival rate. And uh, there's uh, about uh, like 30,000 deaths of a small cell lung cancer uh, in the U.S. Uh, each year. So in 2014, uh, NCI uh, published a scientific framework uh, for the small cell lung cancer. So in this uh, framework, uh, it actually identified four main obstacles to progress. The first obstacle is that uh, the small cell lung cancer um, uh, can develop decades after smoking cessation. So meaning that uh, although you have a lower risk of, of developing uh, lung cancer, but the, you know, the risk is not back to uh, like a non-smoker, as mentioned by uh, the previous uh, speaker. The second obstacle is that uh, the uh, small cell lung cancer tends to metastasize to other place uh, at, a very, uh, at a very early course of its disease. And this actually make a surgery uh, you know, less effective uh, in this uh, cancer type. And the third obstacle is that uh, you know, although the small cell lung cancer is uh, sensitive to radiation therapy and chemotherapy, but over like 95% of uh, patients uh, develop a resist a resistance uh, very quickly. And the last obstacle is that uh, there's a lack of uh, tumor tissue for the clinical molecular and cell biology uh, studies. This is uh, partially because uh, surgery is uh, not a, a very effective uh, treatment modality uh, in this uh, cancer type. All right, so um, I'm going to talk about uh, you know, some uh, basic information about uh, the cancer biology of the small cell lung cancer. So because of the time limit, so it's not impossible for me to talk about uh, every aspect of the small cell lung cancer. So I'm going to focus on the genetic uh, abnormalities of the small cell lung cancer. So the first, uh, the genetic uh, abnormality of small cell lung cancer uh, being noticed is uh, the deletion of uh, chromosomal region uh, 3P21. So in the 1980s, several groups actually made this finding that uh, 
the chromosome 3P is commonly deleted uh, in the small cell lung cancer. So on the left side, actually show the, uh, the staining of uh, metaphase uh, chromosome 3 uh, in five different uh, small cell lung cancer cell lines. So on the uh, left side is actually the chromosome 3 at the normal lens. And on the right side, it shows the shortened uh, chromosome 3 uh, in these cell lines. And here, actually, it's kind of specify uh, what region of the chromosome 3P is deleted. So a common region that's uh, shared you know, in the, all these five cell lines to be deleted is actually chromosome uh, 3P21. So the later study actually has found that a chromosomal uh, region 3P21 is not only deleted in the small cell lung cancer, but it's also deleted in all major type of uh, lung cancers, as well as uh, other uh, epithelial cancers, such as uh, cervical cancer. Uh, interestingly, uh, chromosome 3P deletion appear very early uh, in the course of uh, the lung carcinogenesis. So in the precancerous lesion, you can also find a deletion of the 3P. Actually, I have just uh, uh, listened to an interesting talk given by um, Dr. Thomas Reed over the genetics uh, branch at, at NCI. So he has uh, found that a, a chromosome 3P deletion is also present in the uh, precancerous lesion of uh, cervical cancer. So he actually uh, is uh, doing a clinical trial to test whether this can be used as a biomarker to detect uh, the uh, precancerous region, uh, lesions of the cervical, uh, cervical lesion at a high risk of uh, cervical cancer. I uh, want to point out that, uh, you know, because uh, the 3P deletion is uh, very common in the small cell lung cancer, it's kind of uh, suggests that uh, there may be a tumor suppressor gene in the chromosome 3P that's important for the uh, small cell lung cancer uh, carcinogenesis. So there's a number of uh, candidates, such as uh, BAF1 and uh, the RESF1, and, but, the, uh, the, but the exact uh, the identity of uh, these uh, tumor suppressor gene uh, is still unknown. Sorry. All right. So besides the chromosome 3P deletion, uh, the chromosomal uh, 13Q and uh, 17P deletion are also very common in the small cell lung cancer. So the, uh, the retinoblastoma gene, RB, is actually located on the chromosome uh, three, uh, 13Q. So the Dr. Uh, Frederick uh, K actually asked this question back in 1980s, uh, whether you know, RB is lost in the small cell lung cancer or not. So uh, here is a, a northern blot uh, results uh, taken from his paper. So in the top part of, of the picture actually show the uh, northern blot results of uh, the RB, uh, standard by the RB probe. And the, the bottom part show the, uh, the uh, results from the beta acting uh, probe. So here, the density of the band show the abundance of the MRA. So the first uh, column is actually uh, the, no, uh, the normal lung, uh, normal lung uh, tissues. And the number two to number six are from the non-small cell lung cancer. Seven to nine are from the carcinoids, which are, you know, are also neuroendocrine tumors of the lung, but with a, a lower um, malignant uh, potentials. And from 10 to 16 are from the uh, small cell lung cancer cell lines. So what he observed is that uh, you know, there's a loss of RB uh, expression in the carcinoids, uh, as well as in the small cell lung cancer cell lines. So he actually uh, extended this uh, study to uh, many other uh, small cell lung cancer cell lines, and the results, it was shown in the panel B. So here in the panel B, one to two uh, belongs to the non-small cell lung cancer cell line, and three to 12 are uh, small cell lung cancer cell lines. So as you can see here is that uh, the RB is actually lost in uh, most of the uh, small cell lung cancer cell lines. All right. Uh, during the same time, 
uh, Dr. John Minner uh, also look at uh, the p53 uh, mutation uh, in a small cell lung cancer. So p53 is located uh, in the chromosomal uh, 17 p, which is also uh, commonly uh, like deleted or in the uh, small cell lung cancer. So what he found is that uh, the p53 uh, can have uh, you know many different type of uh, the uh, chromosomal abnormality uh, in uh, all type of uh, lung cancers. And here is a table that show that uh, the uh, p53 uh, can be uh, deleted uh, homozygously, or it can have a different size of uh, MRA due to uh, the tr uh, truncation, or it can have a small or point mutations. So I. Uh, I would like to point out that uh, you know back then we don't have uh, genome sequencing, so he actually used uh, the RNA's uh, protection assay to detect the small uh, point uh, mutations uh, in the p53 genes. So you know here the, he on the table he kind of specified that H187, H345, and also H378 do not have any detectable mutation. But these days we know that uh, there's also there's still like small uh, point of mutations uh, in p fifty p seventy three genes, uh, p fifty three genes, uh, in these uh, small cell lung cancer cell lines. All right. So as I mentioned, so we know that RB and uh, p fifty three genes are commonly, you know, inactivated in the small cell lung cancer cells. But the question is that uh, whether these, uh, you know, loss of uh, tumor suppressor genes, or all these mutations are causative to the small cell lung cancer, or it's just a, a passenger of mutations. So uh, this is, uh, you know, the uh, evidence provided by uh, the uh, Dr. Burns at uh, the uh, Netherlands that if you delete the RB and P53 in the airway of uh, mouse cells, it actually can uh, generate the small cell lung cancer. So what they did is uh, they actually um, uh, they injected the, uh, the pre-containing adenovirus into the trachea of uh, um, genetically modified uh, mouse model so that they can conditionally knock out the p53 and uh, rb genes uh, in these uh, in these mouse uh, so about uh, 2 months after uh, the uh, intratracheal injection of a pre containing adenovirus you can see uh, the hyperplastic uh, lesions present here and this is the uh, hne standing and on b panel show the uh, the brdu standing which show that uh, these lesions are highly proliferated. So if you wait uh, for six months after uh, intratracheal uh, administration of the tree containing adenovirus, small cell lung cancer then develop. And importantly, uh, the small cell lung cancer developed in this mouse model behave similarly as uh, small cell lung cancer uh, in humans. It metastasized very early and very easily. Uh, there's a, a long latent period to develop the small cell lung cancer in this model. Actually, the group has tried to combine the P53 and RB knockout with uh, overexpression of uh, MEC or other type of oncogenes. And that has a, you know, greatly accelerated the formation of the small cell lung cancer uh, in this uh, transgenic uh, mouse model. So, this piece of evidence um, helped to uh, establish the causative role of uh, p53 and rb mutations uh, in the small cell lung cancer all right so uh, i mentioned earlier that uh, the small cell lung cancer can also develop in the patients with a lung adenocarcinoma after uh, treatment with uh, the tyrosine kinase uh, inhibitor so this is a uh, you know a case uh, Actually, uh, a case series reported by um, Dr. Jeffrey uh, Engelman at Dana Farber. So the A actually depicted the disease course of one patient with a lung adenocarcinoma. 
So this patient was diagnosed with the lung adenocarcinoma with the EGFR sensitizing uh, mutation, uh, LA50AR, in 2008. So the patient was treated with alanib. About a year later, he actually developed uh, the uh, small cell lung cancer. So the genetic profiling show that uh, the small cell lung cancer actually has uh, the EGFR LA58R mutation. In addition, the small cell lung cancer also has uh, the PIX3CA uh, mutation. So this patient was treated with uh, chemotherapy and uh, radiation. And after the patient finished uh, the chemoradiation therapy, uh, uh, the patient was back on the Alanib uh, treatment for the, uh, the EGFR uh, positive uh, uh, lung adenocarcinoma. So in the middle of uh, 2010, uh, the patient had a recurrence and then was treated again with a chemotherapy, radiation, and also Alanib. However, the disease was resistant to the treatment. And, and biopsy show that uh, you know, it has a both uh, adenocarcinoma and a small cell lung cancer at the different sites. So the patient eventually died and had an autopsy. And here show the uh, genomic profile of uh, the different cancers in these patients. So just want to point out here is to look at a P53 uh, status. So in the normal liver of these patients, the P53 uh, was a white type. So in the adenocarcinoma, so there's a deletion in one allele of the P53. However, when the patient uh, develop a small cell lung cancer, there's a loss of uh, heterozygosity of a P53 uh, in this patient. And so if you look at an EGFR uh, mutation, you know, all the tumors, you know, either uh, the adenocarcinoma or the small cell lung cancer, uh, all have uh, EGFR LA50AR uh, mutation, meaning that, uh, you know, the adenocarcinoma and uh, the small cell lung cancer all derived from the same clone uh, initially. However, uh, when the adenocarcinoma become resistant, it actually gained uh, the EGFR T790M mutation, but such a mutation you know, was not present in the small cell lung cancer. Uh, instead, uh, the small cell lung cancer had uh, the PIX3CA uh, mutations, uh, which was not present in the uh, the resistant uh, adenocarcinoma, meaning that uh, these two tumors diverge you know, at a certain stage and then gain the separate mutations that become resistant to uh, the treatment. So here it's demonstrated that a P53 is lost in the small cell lung cancer derived from the lung adenocarcinoma. So how about uh, the RB? As we learned from the previous slides that RB is also commonly lost in the small cell lung cancer. So here in the table one, it actually showed a number of the patients, uh, the genomic profiling data. And, and it's probably you know, too busy for you to really look through right now. But I would just like to summarize that, you know, in the patient who initially had a lung adenocarcinoma, but developed a small cell lung cancer, uh, as specified here as a neuroendocrine tumor, and there's a loss of RB in all the cases, all right? And, but RB is, was still intact in the, in the tumors that remains to be uh, adenocarcinoma, either prior or after uh, the treatment. So again, you know, this proves that uh, the P53 and RB uh, are important uh, in the uh, small cell lung cancer uh, carcinogenesis. All right, so now actually we are in the uh, genomic era of uh, the cancers. So there have been a number of uh, large studies to look at uh, the, uh, the genomic uh, uh, abnormalities of the small cell lung cancer. And actually uh, one reason to do such kind of analysis is uh, try to find whether there's any actionable mutations in the small cell lung cancer that can be treated with uh, you know, either the target therapy or other, other kind of uh, small molecule inhibitors. Uh, so here I only uh, include the data from uh, one of the largest study, 
which was published in 2015 uh, Nature. And this study uh, sequenced about a, a sequenced uh, the small cell lung cancer from over 150 patients. And the data actually uh, is uh, summarized here. So the first thing you notice that uh, on the top of uh, this uh, uh, panel show that uh, P53 and RB1 are the most commonly uh, mutated genes uh, in small cell lung cancer, so which is uh, consistent with the previous finding. So the mutation of these two genes uh, are present in like over 95% and 85% uh, uh, of uh, patients. Uh, the second uh, group of genes that uh, need to be uh, that's worth of mentioning, uh, mentioning is uh, the e, uh, EP300 and also CREBBP. Uh, these two genes are uh, histone acetyltransferase, so and those genes are involved in the gene transcription. And the third class of uh, genes uh, that are commonly mutated in uh, small cell lung cancer are the notch uh, gene, notch family genes, such as notch one, two, four. Uh, on the right-hand side, actually show uh, what genes are commonly deleted or amplified in the small cell lung cancer. Um, the blue color represents genes that are commonly deleted in the small cell lung cancer, such as uh, uh, P53 and RB, uh, CEDKN2A uh, is a P16, and FHIT is a gene that located in the chromosomal uh, 3P, as mentioned that uh, chromosomal 3P is also commonly deleted in the, uh, in the lung cancer. So on the right hand side, it shows that uh, the MEC family genes are commonly amplified in small cell lung cancer. And uh, the uh, fibro uh, fibroblast growth factor receptor 1 uh, and uh, the RS2, which play a role in the PI3 kinase uh, signaling, are commonly uh, amplified. All right, so here uh, the, actually um, the author summarized the, the uh, pathways that are recurrently affected in the small cell lung cancer. So let's look at uh, the top left panel, which actually show that a P53 and RB1, both of them are important the checkpoint of the cell cycle, are commonly mutated in the small cell lung cancer. So in real cases, uh, that does not have a RB1 mutation, it was found that uh, the uh, cycling D1 is uh, amplified uh, due to the chromosomal rearrangement so that it can bypass the RB1. Um, in the second, in the, uh, the up right panel, I show that uh, the, uh, some of uh, the oncogenes are like a very rarely uh, mutated in the small cell lung cancer, such as uh, the PIX3CA and uh, the KIT uh, oncogene, as well as the uh, fibroblast, uh, fibroblast growth factor receptor one. So I mentioned earlier that uh, the uh, two uh, histone acetyltransferase are commonly mutated in small cell lung cancer, but their roles are still not very clear. Uh, mixed genes is commonly uh, amplified. So here in the lower, lower right panel actually show that the notch family genes you know, are commonly mutated in the small cell lung cancer. Uh, notch signaling actually is a very important in controlling the uh, neuroendocrine differentiation by affecting the expression of uh, uh, ASCL1 as uh, shown here. So ASCL1 is uh, a master transcriptional factor uh, for the neuroendocrine differentiation. And, it, and the notch signaling actually can suppress the expression of ASCL1. So in the small cell lung cancer, uh, when notch receptor is mutated, it, it actually decreases uh, the notch signaling so that ASCL1 can be upregulated. That leads to the neuroendocrine differentiation uh, in small cell lung cancer. All right, so I want to just uh, like talk a little bit more about notch signaling. And this is a cartoon shows the, uh, the signaling cascade of uh, the notch uh, pathway. 
So the notch receptors are membrane receptors. So when there's a appropriate ligand and uh, the notch receptor will change its uh, uh, the uh, configuration so that it exposes uh, its uh, uh, susceptible sites to the gamma secretase. So gamma secretase will cleave the notch receptor so that uh, the intracellular domain of a notch receptor can serve as a signaling molecule and migrate into the nucleus. So once uh, this, uh, the notch intracellular domain get into the nucleus, it actually can bind to uh, the complex formed by the mastermind-like protein uh, as abbreviated as a, a MAMO1 here, as well as its partner, uh, RBPJ. And I would like to think that uh, the uh, notch intracellular domain serve as a key, so then it put insert into the lock formed by the MAMO1 and RBPJ, and then activate the downstream, downstream uh, gene transcription, such as HAS and uh, HEI gene expression. All right. Okay, so to explore the role of the notch signaling in the small cell lung cancer, actually uh, the author of the Nature paper, uh, you know, uh, established a transgenic mice that can overexpress the notch two intracellular domain, so so that uh, the notch signaling can be uh, constitutively turned on in these uh, transgenic mice. So here show the uh, formation of a small cell lung cancer in the transgenic mouse model with uh, three genes knock out, including P53, RB1, and RB1. Uh, and here show the uh, transgenic mice with uh, the forced expression of uh, NOTCH2 intracellular domain. As you can see from here is that uh, there's a decreased uh, number of uh, small cell lung cancer in the lungs uh, of these uh, transgenic mice uh, when the NOTCH2 uh, ICD is overexpressed. And here shows the quantitative data that the number of the tumors as well as the volume of the tumors uh, got decreased. And on the right hand side shows the, uh, the survival curve of these uh, trans transgenic mice. And the forced expression of a notch 2 intracellular domain actually extended the survival of uh, the, these uh, transgenic mice. So again, it supports that uh, the uh, inactivation of uh, notch signaling uh, plays a very important role uh, in the carcinogenesis of the small cell lung cancer. All right, so next I'm just going to give you a few examples of uh, the successful translational uh, medicine in the small cell lung cancer. So first I will talk about a, a robot T. So again, it's related to the notch signaling. So let's uh, kind of uh, go back and look at uh, this uh, signaling cascade. So there's a, a number of the ligands that can bind to the notch receptor. And one of the ligand is uh, DLL3, which is uh, actually a ligand that can inactivate the notch signaling. So a group of uh, scientists from the uh, STEM Centrix, a company based in the Southern California, actually made a finding, uh, made independent finding uh, a number of years ago that uh, the uh, DLL3, which is an antagonizing ligand of the notch signaling, uh, is overexpressed in the small cell lung cancer. So here show the uh, expression of a DL3 based on the RNAC data. So the y-axis show the R RPKM uh, number. And uh, so in, as you can see from here, that uh, the small cell lung cancer has a, a much higher expression of a DL3, about a 40 to 50 fold higher than the uh, normal lung tissue. And here show the small cell lung cancer cell line, which also has pretty high expression of uh, DL3. So I just want to stop here for a little bit so that if you have a such kind of finding, so how would you like translate into you know, patient care? So 
actually, you know, the the scientists from the the Stan Centrix uh, kind of develop a new strategy to target the DL3 on the small cell lung cancer cells. So they actually develop an antibody drug conjugate. So here show the structure of uh, this uh, antibody drug conjugate, and this is uh, something they call the Robert T. So this is formed by an antibody that can recognize uh, DL3 on the surface of the small cell lung cancer. And this uh, antibody is actually conjugated through a linker uh, with uh, the uh, very toxic uh, chemo agent it's called a PBD. The PBD can bind to the smaller groove of the DNA, so cause the DNA damage. But PBD itself is very toxic, toxic, so you cannot give it to the patient uh, directly. So what it happens is that uh, once you uh, put the PBD as a payload to the antibody, and then this has become a very target agent that can deliver the PBD specifically to the cancer cells that express uh, DL3. So here show the, uh, the uh, experiment data of uh, the efficacy of uh, uh, Robot-T uh, in a patient-derived uh, xenograft MOS model. Uh, let me just help you to go through this. Um, so first they established uh, the, the PDX model of a small cell lung cancer. Then they treated the, uh, the mice with uh, uh, the EP. So here C stands for cisplatin and E stands for etopside. So EP chemotherapy. So there's a shrinkage of uh, tumor volume. But what happens afterwards is that uh, the, uh, the tumor recur very fast. Uh, I'm sorry, let's go back. And then if you don't give any treatment, as a, depicted as a black curve, the tumor will just grow continuously. And here, they actually, for some of uh, the mice, they actually give uh, the uh, DL3 antibody drug conjugate, and uh, the tumor size shrinks again. But importantly, this, uh, the effect uh, lasted you know, for a very long time, so much better than the chemotherapy uh, agent. So here in the panel I, they also kind of uh, tested the rechallenging of uh, the mice with the chemo agent. Again, those uh, PDX uh, mice were treated with a chemotherapy first, and then when they had a recurrence, these mice were treated with uh, the EP uh, chemo agent again. As is shown here, so this time the response uh, lasted uh, even shorter compared to the first time, and those uh, tumors are growing back as depicted as uh, the, the blue curve here. So at least from the PDX MOS model, it showed that uh, the DL3 antibody drug conjugate seems to be more effective uh, than rechallenging the this uh, PDX uh, mice with the uh, chemo agent again when the tumor had a recurrence. All right, so with that data, then they moved this drug into uh, the clinical trial. And this is uh, uh, the result from the phase one trial uh, reported by Charles Rudin from the Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, in 2016 uh, ASCO meeting. So in this uh, phase one trial, they included 74 uh, small cell lung cancer patients who had a recurrence after the, at least the one line of uh, chemotherapy. So some patients had a uh, sensitive uh, disease and some had a resistant and a refractory disease. So the definition of a sensitive, a resistant, and refractory disease are explained here. So basically, uh, if a patient uh, does, uh, does, not, uh, does not have a progression disease, after uh, three months after the first line chemotherapy, then it's considered as a sensitive disease. So meaning the disease is uh, sensitive to the chemotherapy and the effect is uh, durable more than three months. So if a patient had a rec uh, recurrence or progression of disease within the three months after the chemotherapy, then it's considered as a resistant disease. So if a patient did not have any response but continue to have a progression of disease, meaning that tumor continue to grow even when patient is receiving uh, chemotherapy, 
is considered as a refractory disease. So we just want to kind of point out here that, uh, you know, about 67% of patients has a, like uh, more than 50% of tumor cells with the uh, uh, DL3 expression, meaning that uh, this uh, target is uh, highly expressed in uh, the small cell lung cancer patients. Here is uh, the objective uh, response rate of uh, the, uh, the ROVA-T uh, in this uh, clinical, phase one clinical trial. So as shown here is a uh, objective uh, response rate that include uh, the completed response, meaning there's no more tumor plus uh, the partial response. That meaning that a tumor decrease size by more than 30%. So if you don't select any biomarker, you know, in all the patients, no matter whether a patient express a DL3 or not, you have 18% of patients who had a response. When you select for the patient who uh, has uh, more than 50% uh, tumor cells expressing uh, the DL3, the response rate uh, improved to uh, 39%. And on the right-hand side actually shows the clinical benefit rate, which uh, includes a patient who had a response and the patient who had a stable disease uh, after the treatment. So again, it shows that when you selected for the biomarker, the response rate uh, got much better. And this is uh, the, uh, water, uh, the uh, water plot of uh, the uh, response, uh, the best response after treatment. And here, they actually stratify a patient based on the expression level of a DL3. So all these patients uh, had a shrinkage of the tumor, but the patient that under the dot line is considered to have a response after treatment. As you can see here that, uh, you know, all, most of the patients who had a response uh, had an expression of a DL3 uh, more than 50%. And some of the patients with a gray bar just do not have uh, the uh, data on the DL3 uh, expression. But again, it makes a lot of sense because uh, this is a, a target agent. So you need to have a target in order for the drug to, uh, to take effect. All right, so actually uh, currently uh, the company has uh, moved forward to uh, the uh, pivotal try uh, to, you know, to uh, gain the approval uh, by the FDA uh, for this drug. All right. All right, so uh, now we are also in the immune therapy uh, era. So, you know, it's impossible not to mention about immune therapy uh, in the small cell lung cancer. All right, so this is a, a very uh, famous data that show the mutation load in the different cancer types. And because of the time uh, limit, so I just want to point out that, uh, so as is shown in by the arrow here, the small cell lung cancer uh, also has a very high uh, mutation load compared to uh, other tumor type. So what's the significance? So although we don't really know exactly uh, what's the relationship between the uh, mutation load and uh, the response to immune therapy, but it appears that if a patient, the tumor has more mutation, so that generate more new antigen that can be recognized by the immune system in the body. So that a you know, patient may have the uh, T lymphocytes that can recognize the tumor cells. So although the body may have the T cells that can recognize uh, the, the tumor, but doesn't mean that uh, the immune system is turned on to uh, eliminate the tumors. That's because uh, you know, the body has uh, the different immune checkpoints that helps to uh, inhibit the immune response. That actually is uh, used to, as a protective mechanism to protect uh, the body parts from, you know, the, uh, from the being attacked by the immune system. However, the tumor cells can take advantage of that. So there's a two uh, immune checkpoints that can be targeted by uh, the approved FDA drug. One is uh, the CTLA-4 that can be targeted by epilumumab. 
And the other one is uh, PD-1 and PD-L1 system. So that uh, can be uh, targeted by the, the PD, uh, PD-L1 or PD-1 antibody. So how about the expression of uh, PD-1 or PD-L1 in the small cell lung cancer? So as shown here that uh, the, uh, the uh, PD-1 or PD-L1 positive cells are present in the, uh, the stromal cells instead of uh, inside of uh, the uh, small cell lung cancer uh, tumors. Uh, but this, uh, you know, uh, when this paper was published in 2015, there, there's a, a letter to the editor submitted later, which I just show that, uh, you know, if you use a different antibody, some of uh, the small cell lung cancer uh, can also have a positive staining of uh, the uh, PD-1 or PD-L1. So this is uh, the summary of uh, that study. And basically, as I mentioned that, uh, they did not find any uh, PD-1 or PD-L1 positive cells in the tumor, but they found uh, positive cells in the uh, stroma. So uh, it raised a, you know, kind of a, a question, you know, if you give a patient just a PD-L1, whether that will be effective enough to, uh, to activate the immune system because uh, it seems like the immune cells are like out of the periphery of the tumor, but not really inside the tumor. So there's kind of a, a, a kind of a, um, leads to this idea to combine the uh, anti pd one with the CTLA, CTLA4 antibody. So this is a checkmate 032 study. And uh, so here they actually tried uh, like three different, have a three different arms. The first arm is just uh, uh, anti pd one itself. It's a nevo, uh, nevo lumumab. And the second and third arms are the combination of uh, anti pd one with uh, the CTLA-4 uh, antibody, but at the different uh, dosing uh, frequency. So the middle one is a NIVO-1 plus a FP3, and the last one is a NIVO-3 plus FP1. So this is uh, the uh, patient characteristics. So just want to point out that uh, uh, if you look at a PD-L1 expression level, um, the uh, most patients has a very little expression of PD-L1. And so here is uh, the response data. So if uh, in the arm with uh, just a NIVO alone, there's about uh, the 10% uh, of uh, response rate. And when you combine NIVO with the epilumab, so there's uh, the respo response rate uh, get doubled. And uh, on the right-hand side, which are the uh, spider plots, which show how each patient responded to the therapy. So the only thing that I want to bring you to attention is uh, there's a long tails which show that uh, the tumors can be put in check by the therapy for a very long period of time. And the therapy itself is not benign. So some patients may also have very severe uh, autoimmune disease after treatment. So there's a, a number of uh, other promising agents that are under clinical development, such as a V1 inhibitor, a 20% of uh, objective response rate was reported in a very small uh, phase one trial. Uh, PARP inhibitor is also promising. And um, so a 10% of uh, the partial response was reported in a phase one trial. And in importantly, uh, Slothlin 11 uh, is identified as a potential uh, predicted biomarker of the PARP1 inhibitor uh, in small cell. And uh, uh, Aurora kinase A is also promising, and 21% uh, of uh, partial response rate was reported in a multi center uh, phase two trial. All right, so I just want to mention that uh, uh, Dr. Beverly Teicher uh, at uh, NCI Frederick and you know, and, he, uh, and her group did a, a large study. She, uh, she actually screened over 64 small cell lung cancer cell lines uh, uh, and over uh, 100 uh, FDA approved oncological drug 
as well as uh, over 400 uh, investigational drugs and look see what drug is effective in the small cell lung cancer. And this is a paper that you can look. So the, uh, the typical response is that uh, you know, some tumors are sensitive, some are resistant. And this is to be uh, the common theme in all these drugs. And this is a website that uh, you can look at their data because uh, you know, it has the gene expression data of over 64 cell lines and also included the, the IC50 values of uh, you know, over 500 compounds. So it can be a great resource if you are interested in the small cell lung cancer research. All right, because of time limit, I will skip this. So just to summarize that uh, small cell lung cancer is a recalcitrant cancer and new therapy is urgently needed. And P53 and RB1 are commonly lost in the small cell lung cancer. And the newer therapies such as the antibody drug conjugate and also immune therapy are, uh, are coming. All right, thank you so much. And if you have any question, I will be happy to take it. Subtype. Yes, I think so. Yes. So the actually, you know, in the Beverly Touch study, and she actually tried to group a small cell lung cancer based on the microRNA expression, and that seems to be, you know, and the expression of certain microRNA may correlate with, uh, you know, sensitivity to a particular type of a drugs. So that seems to be the case. All right, thank you so much.